Hi, everyone. My name is Dylan Pfaffer. Uh, here's an example of a spherical FTBR display called CoGlobe. It was exhibited at SIGGRAPH last year. Uh, it features multiple projectors and a curved projection surface that can render a contained virtual environment in a physical space. Uh, here's some first-person video of the display exhibiting a fishbowl scene. Uh, users may walk completely around the display while the content is rendered securely inside. There's two important depth cues that contribute to the 3D fidelity of these displays. Uh, motion parallax is the perception that while you're moving, objects closer to you seem to move faster than objects farther away. This depth cue can be implemented with head tracking and perspective corrected rendering and is a basic requirement of FTBR. A stereopsis, or a stereo for short, is the perception of depth through binocular disparity. Uh, this depth cue can be implemented by rendering a distinct image to each eye. Doing so can be expensive or technologically challenging, so it's not always included uh, in FTBR displays. Early user studies that used a single CRT monitor showed a surprising result. Even though stereo was thought to be the strongest depth cue, motion parallax alone resulted in better performance than stereo alone for 3D perception tasks. It's important to note that for these early displays, users would remain seated in front of the display and would benefit from motion parallax by moving their head back and forth. This led many this led to many follow-on FTVR displays, especially multi-screen displays, like the Sphere, QB, and Telehuman, to drop stereo altogether for a glasses-free 3D experience. It was thought that by allowing users to stand up and walk around the displays, there would be even more of a benefit for motion parallax. Because of these differences, research on the relative importance of stereo and motion parallax within single-screen FTVR may lack validity for multi-screen FTVR. Another important contributor to 3D fidelity is viewpoint calibration. FTVR displays require careful calibration of the user's viewpoint to the rendered perspective of the scene, and bad calibration can cause noticeable visual artifacts. Uh, visual distortion caused by viewing from the wrong perspective can be minimized through the process of viewpoint calibration. In this example, the lines that make up the colored grid should be straight, but can appear bent when viewed from the wrong perspective, like in the image on the left. This led us to two research questions. Similar to previous research with FTVR, we wanted to know how important the inclusion of stereo is with regards to users' performance in 3D tasks and their subjective preference. We were also interested in gathering accuracy requirements for viewpoint calibration. But building spherical displays is challenging, and they still have a variety of fidelity problems which could impact a perceptual study. Stereo technology has improved a lot since the days of CRT displays. However, using shutter glasses still caused a noticeable reduction in display brightness. It was also challenging to find stereo that did not interfere with our head tracking technology and that could be toggled on and off at the same time as the display. Another issue was with calibration error and latency. The displays we had access to were still in the prototype stage. They had noticeable errors in pixel position and noticeable latency with regards to head movements, especially as the user got closer. So to get around these limitations, we created a simulated spherical FTVR within VR and conducted the entire study in immersive VR. So here's an example of the same fishbowl scene that you saw in the first video, but from within our VR environment on a virtual FTVR display using a VR headset. All of the display components like projectors, tracking systems, display surface, and stereo capabilities were simulated and provided a higher 3D fidelity experience than the physical display that it was modeled on. So using this virtual system meant that we could get extremely low latency head tracking from the VR headset and provide a perfectly calibrated spherical FTVR display. 
It also allowed us to easily toggle the stereo rendering of the display without affecting brightness or requiring the user to change equipment. Now that we had a controlled environment, we ran a user study in VR designed to answer our research questions about stereo and its effect on calibration accuracy, user preference, and user performance. It featured 21 participants, a single factor, three experiments, uh, including a pattern alignment task featuring a recently proposed perceptual calibration technique, a subjective preference task that had users select their preferred condition, and finally, a set of 3D point cloud tasks to measure user performance. We also performed a stereo acuity test in VR, which we used to exclude some participants' data, and monitored motion sickness using a virtual reality sickness questionnaire. So the single factor we controlled was viewing condition. In the stereo viewing condition, the FTBR display and VR headset rendered distinct images for each eye. This represents the use case of multi-screen FTBR with stereo. In the non-stereo viewing condition, the FTBR display only renders one image to the midpoint of the eyes, while the headset still renders to both eyes. This represents the typical use case of multi-screen FTBR without stereo. The environment still provides binocular disparity, however the display does not. And in monocular, the FTBR display and headset render one image to one eye. This represents the use case of a user closing one eye to look at the display. This is sometimes done to increase the accuracy of the rendering. So in the first task, a pattern was rendered to a fixed point in space, and the participant aligned their viewpoint to that point as closely as possible. The pattern was designed to guide the user to the correct location through interpretation of the visible distortions. The distortions appear as bent lines and squished circles. If the participant aligns their view to the correct location, then the pattern appears undistorted. Bent lines become straight, and squished circles become perfect circles. So we found no significant difference in time on the left, but on the right-hand side, uh, note the red line labeled initial error. This is how far away the rendering of the pattern started at. So stereo in red had a thick black border indicating that it was the significant best condition. And the dashed lines indicate there was a significant difference between stereo and the other two conditions. This task showed a strong effect of viewing condition on calibration accuracy. In the next experiment, participants were instructed to inspect a scene in condition A and then condition B, and then choose their preference. They repeated this for all possible pairs of conditions. We enforced a minimum amount of movement by, by requiring users to cross the red bar in each condition. We asked the participants to choose the condition that appeared the most 3D and the one where the statue seemed to move around the least. The statue is fixed inside the display. However, it is possible in non-stereo that users may perceive movement as they move around. The effect is caused by the fact that perspective corrected images cannot be rendered to both eyes so they'll be viewed from a slightly incorrect position. Uh, we found no significant effects using pairwise comparisons. When we aggregated them, the data show that stereo and non-stereo may be slightly preferred over monocular. We expected stereo to be strongly preferred because it would have no visual artifacts, unlike non-stereo, or the discomfort of closing one eye, like monocular. But we found no significant agreement between participants for preferences. In the last experiment, participants completed three performance tasks with 3D point clouds adapted from previous AR research. In this first task, participants were asked to judge which pair of points, red or yellow, <coughs> had the smallest distance between them. This task relied on a user's perception of the 3D content alone. So in the conditions that lacked stereo depth cues, we expected participants to rely more on motion parallax by moving their head around a lot more. In the second task, participants were asked to select four target points that were highlighted red.
And in the last performance task, participants were asked to align a semi-transparent cutting plane to intersect three, red po- three clusters of red points, which turned blue when they were intersected. So for performance, results were much clearer. Stereo improved time and accuracy in most of the tasks we tested, whereas non-stereo was detrimental to performance. We found no change in accuracy for the manipulation task, which was similar to that of the original augmented reality study using this task. This may be due to the high difficulty of the task, particularly for novice VR users. So during our performance tasks, we also recorded head movement of participants using the tracking system of the VR headset. We hypothesized that users would use motion parallax more in conditions without stereo. However, that wasn't the case. Even when instructed that motion parallax may be beneficial, it was an underutilized depth cue. We also noticed during the pattern alignment task that users would rather stand comfortably and submit a measurement with noticeable error than to crouch down for better accuracy. So user comfort may be a priority in these displays. Uh, With spherical FTVR, users didn't have a strong preference for stereo, nor even really notice the visual artifacts present without stereo, but they consistently performed better with stereo. Therefore, a design recommendation for such displays is that glasses-free non-stereo is fine for casual use and should be calibrated to within six and a half centimeters. But stereo should be included if used for 3D tasks and calibrated to within three centimeters. (coughs) VR is an excellent test bed for prototyping and evaluating 3D display design. Because the physical properties of the display can be simulated and their efficacy can be evaluated for different designs and for different degrees of fidelity. For example, you could control calibration accuracy, tracker latency, display latency, display brightness, or even the stereo capabilities of the display like we did. Uh, Thank you. I'm going to bring it over. First him, then you, Steve, okay? Okay. Steve Feiner, Columbia University. Um, Thanks for the talk. This is really interesting work. Um, One thing that you get out of actual physical display is Virgin's accommodation uh, match. Um, And I was wondering, since you don't have the ability to change accommodation, um, and you are looking at something that's relatively close, which accommodation really is quite important. Mm-hmm. Um, what your feelings are about not having that? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Thank you. Um, that's something we looked at with the physical display is that, mm-hmm. yeah, people get to focus on, their eyes focus on the display that's quite far away, and then the content doesn't vary in depth very much because the sphere is only so big, so mm-hmm. it works quite well. But in VR, you're focused on the screens right in front of your eyes. So it's not an issue that we looked at in this particular research. Uh, but I think it's something that would definitely be good to think about. Thank you. Hi, I'm Juliana Franz from the Haas University. Um, so we've done this as well as using VR environments to simulate real environments in order to run our te- experiments. Uh, one thing that I have to ask, do you think the selection technique that you use it might have biased your um, results? Because we asked many times, should we be using ray casting, should we be using something different yeah. uh, in order for precision or human performance tasks in VR? Yeah, that's a great question. That's, there's so many different selection techniques in 3D, which one to use. Uh, we just selected the one that had the most uh, accessibility for the display. We could just render the ray inside the display like we could in a physical display. Uh, Because in VR, you can do a lot of different selection techniques, but we were limited to the ones that we could actually implement on a physical display. And so I think that's one where, uh, in non-stereo especially, people struggled with because they couldn't tell where the ray started and where it ended. 
So I'd, I'd love to look at different selection techniques uh, within these displays. All right, cool. Uh, uh, this is Mike McGuffin. I found it interesting that you, you found the motion parallax was underutilized. And I'm thinking if the user could rotate the, uh, the display with their hand, maybe with a mouse or something like that, maybe that would be easier than rotating their head around it. And so maybe that would, uh, maybe we'd see the user making more use of motion parallax in that case. So then I have a question. Based on the literature you, you looked at and your own data, do you have a feeling for the minimum angle of rotation where we could say, yes, the user is making use of motion parallax? Uh, oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, Previously, I do know in the CRT displays, they looked a lot at motion parallax. And instead of having the user move the head around, they said, why don't we move the content, like you described. And so they would rotate it back and forth, 5 or 10 degrees or something. Uh, but sometimes that you can't really do that uh, with the content, especially if you're trying to make it physically situated and you don't want it to move because it's supposed to be in your physical environment. So why is it rotating? But that's definitely an approach uh, as far as the actual degrees, I think it's quite small. It's not like massive head movements, so you could probably get a lot of information just from a small amount of head movements. Okay, thanks. Hi, my name is Ari. I'm from the MIT Media Lab. Um, I, my question is similar, and I'm wondering if you think that discomfort with being in a headset is the reason pe people don't make use of motion parallax, sort of like when people put on a headset, they freeze because they yeah. don't want to like, move around. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, we had a couple participants, I think, after the study mentioned that that may have been a reason that they didn't move around as much is because they were in a VR headset and one person said, I didn't want to break it because I thought it was expensive. And so that was like, that's a great, great thing. I think once the displays get a little bit better, we can just run the study right on the, the physical display and see the difference.